Α περάσουμε στο επόμενο μα θέμα τη απόψηνή μα εκπομπή που έχει να κάνει με την διάλεξη που διοργάνωσε το Hellenic Psychiatric Association στο Hellenic Center την περασμένη Παρασκευή. Κύριο ομιλητή ήταν ο Professor David Hughes, ο οποίο εργάζεται στο University College του Λονδίνου, στο κλάδο Institute of Child Health. Θέμα τη ομιλία του ήταν The Asclepia Narration 2015, Changing Concepts of the Autumns in the 21st Century. Την εκδήλωση συντόνισε η Dr. Ελένη Παλαζίδου, η οποία είναι και πρόεδρο τη ΕΚΑ. Θα περάσουμε πρώτα να παρακολουθήσουμε το καλωσόρισμα από την κυρία Παλαζίδου, η οποία παρουσίασε τον κύριο μιλητή, Professor David Hughes, και στη συνέχεια απόσπασμα από την διάλεξή του. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of the Hellenic Psychiatric Association of the UK to this year's Asclepian Oration. This is our second year for the Asclepian Oration. Our group is relatively young. Uh, we've been in existence for no more than five or six years, but we have been active and we're growing. We hold academic meetings which are informative, uh, of high academic caliber, and useful to all, irrespective of experience. And we particularly aim to nurture the younger professionals still in training. In addition to the academic aims, our meetings also offer opportunities for networking, as well as social contact, and this is something that is very much valued by all of us in the group. The meetings have been so far limited to health professionals. However, this is now changing. We have recently joined the Hellenic Center, so we're full members of the organization, and this is actually our first event at the Hellenic Center. Membership to the center means that we are able to hold our academic meetings here, which for practical reasons is obviously very uh, useful to us uh, to have a stable base, a stable venue for the meetings. But also, and most importantly, this makes our lectures available to the wider uh, community. And I'm delighted to see today uh, quite a few people who are known um, professionals attending the meeting. Now, as you know, the meeting is about Asclepius, Asclepius, and it's called the Asclepian Oration. Now, why Asclepius? I won't say very much, so I don't have time to talk about Asclepius, but just very briefly to put it in context. Asclepius was, um, was the god of medicine. He was considered the dispenser of healing, but also he was a highly skilled professional, a highly skilled doctor. He was associated with concepts such as Iyia, in Greek means Iyia means health, Iaso, recuperation from illness, Panakia or Panacea, universal remedy. And these names came after the mythological names of some of the daughters of Asclepius. He had lots of children. There was no clear distinction in the ancient medical world between the spiritual and the physical worlds. Um, Asclepius represents the healing aspect of the medical arts. And without denying its solid scientific base, medicine today in clinical party, practice, and particularly psychiatry, relies also on art. It is an art to make the connection with the patient. So for this reason, we chose Asclepius as our patron for this oration. Well, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to see so many people here. I'd like to extend a special welcome to the Cultural Councillor of the Cyprus High Commission, Achilleas Hajikiriakou, who has taken the time out of his very busy schedule to accept our invitation to attend this meeting. I'd also like to um, welcome and thank the Hellenic TV for covering this event and making it accessible to an even wider audience. Uh, thank you. Thank you, up there. And it is now time to welcome our uh, special keynote speaker, Professor David Skews, who will deliver this year's oration. 
Professor Skews doesn't need an uh, introduction to many of you, but for those who don't know him, uh, Eva could say a few words about his wide, wide range of expertise. He is Professor of Behavioral and Brain Sciences at the Institute of Child Health at the University College London. He's also honorary consultant in developmental neuropsychiatry at the Institute of Child Health at the University College of London. He's an honorary consultant in developmental, um, sorry, he, he qualified in medicine at Manchester University and he subsequently trained in academic child psychiatry at the Institute of Psychiatry at the Motsley Hospital. Uh, and then he moved to the Institute of Child Health in 1985 where he obtained his higher research degree. His team, based at Great Ormond Street Hospital, provides a national clinical service for children with high-functioning autism spectrum disorders. Dr. Skews' approach to research is quintessentially interdisciplinary and translational. He has fostered a range of current national and international research collaborations on the development of social cognition. And these range from basic sciences, genetics, neuropeptides, metabolic disorders, through epidemiology to clinical applications, a true translational approach. He has been closely involved in the development of novel methodologies for the assessment of autistic traits, including the computerized 3DI interview for autistic spectrum disorders and related conditions, and this is used by over 20 countries worldwide, many in translation in their own language. He has served on a large number of editorial boards and formally edited the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. He's currently also editor of the Journal of International Psychiatry. He has been elected a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. I could go on, but uh, I better stop here and allow Professor Skews to deliver his lecture. Well, thank you, Eleni. Thank you um, very much for inviting me. Um, I, I want to uh, talk about how our concepts of what autism is uh, are changing in the 21st century. And my experience in this subject goes back to the 1970s uh, when I was training at the, at the Maudsley. So I've, I've seen some pretty radical uh, changes in that time. So I want to bring you right up to date. Um, but I'm going to start by saying something about uh, the history of autism, because some of you who may be a child psychiatrist will know this, but of course many of you will not. Um, this is, by the way, a, a really good history. If anybody's interested in looking at um, the, uh, a very readable book on people who've been involved in the development of ideas of autism over the last uh, 70 years, um, Adam Feinstein's book called A History of Autism is well worth looking at. But autism entered the scientific literature in 1944. Between 1980 and 2013, it's quite a long gap between the time it first entered the scientific literature and the time it became recognized as a separate disease. That wasn't until uh, 1980. Between 1980 and 2013, this is how we conceptualized it. And just to um, uh, reiterate the, uh, those of you who aren't familiar with the diagnostic criteria, it's what was described as a triad of impairments, that is to say, problems in social interaction so another, and the reciprocity of social interaction, the ability to hold a conversation that flowed. The ability in some perhaps less able uh, individuals to communicate at all um, and a lack of nonverbal skills and perhaps a lack of imagination, but also um, some repetitive and stereotype behaviours, including uh, motor behaviours, um, and inflexibility, and by that we mean cognitive inflexibility, uh, which might 
be manifest as a resistance to change, for example, or very, very focused interests where you couldn't um, shift from, from one interest to another, which, uh, which of course uh, many scientists have the same uh, characteristics. Um, and, and some have argued that, of course, many scientists could be regarded as being on the autism spectrum. But anyway, we'll, we'll pass over that for the moment. Um, interestingly, back at the, the when the, the concept of autism was first described by this fellow, Leo Kanner, and it was sometimes called Kanner's syndrome at that time, in the 1940s, he suggested possibly some of them are brain damaged, but possibly all of them are schizophrenic. And so way back when autism was first described, there was real confusion as to whether autism and schizophrenia were somehow related. Um, of course, our concepts of what schizophrenia was were somewhat different at that time, and they were very different in the United States to what they were in the UK. So they had a very much broader concept of what schizophrenia was, and, and, and Leo Kanna was, uh, uh, was, was obviously influenced by that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about diagnostic practice, because after all, diagnostic practice underlies changing concepts, what we regard as a psychiatric disorder is defined according to two diagnostic systems that exist. Um, one which is used in the US, which is called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, and the other of which is used in the rest of the world, uh, which is called the International Classification of Disease. And the International Classification of Disease is now in its 10th revision. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is now in its 5th revision, and I'll say some more about that in a moment. Um, the 11th revision of the International Classification, I'm afraid, is lagging behind because too many people have to agree uh, as to what that should be, and so it's still mired in the committees of the World Health Organization. Um, but in general, the two psychiatric class aspects of the classifications um, tend to agree, not entirely, but they tend to agree. So, but anyway, way back in 1952, when the first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association appeared, uh, they claimed that the primary manifestation of childhood schizophrenia was autism. In other words, the two things were very, very closely linked together conceptually. And in fact, at that time, autism wasn't classified as a separate condition at all. It was autism-related behaviors were regarded as part of what they called a childhood schizophrenic reaction. Um, and indeed, one of the leading journals um, of child psychopathology at that time was called the Journal of Autism and Childhood Schizophrenia. And that journal continued to be called that up until uh, January 1979. So there's a very long history, 35 years or so, of a sort of equation between what was regarded as autism and what was regarded as schizophrenia. Now, back in 1979, I was working for this fellow, Michael Rutter, now Sir Michael Rutter, uh, who was a professor, yet to be Sir Michael, uh, at the Institute of Psychiatry. And he felt strongly that autism and schizophrenia were entirely separate conditions. And he was instrumental, along with uh, his, uh, these other editors of that journal, in changing the title. So it became the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders rather than the Journal of Autism and Childhood Schizophrenia. And that was a very important step in our understanding of autism. 
And if I had suggested when I was working him, for him that there was any connection whatsoever between autism and schizophrenia, I would have been in big trouble. I was Ολόκληρη την εκδήλωση θα την παρακολουθήσετε προσεχώς στην εκπομπή με το φακό του Hellenic TV.